If you're a regular viewer of my channel, you've heard me speak at length about the criterion of embarrassment before. Most notably, that this is not a historical criteria that is used outside of New Testament studies, only within the New Testament for some reason. I'm still waiting for an example of its use by a professional historian in any other context. Are you challenging me? A common argument from biblical skeptics is that something known as the criterion of embarrassment is only used to defend the Bible, and it is not used by historians studying any other area of history. Um, the criterion of embarrassments, that's not really used in, in historical studies at all to prove anything about history. The criterion of embarrassment, the criterion of the, the other criterion, those methodologies you're using don't seem to be used anywhere else in history except in for New Testament scholarship, which is not really accepted by the vast majority of historians. The criterion of embarrassment is when an ancient author admits something in his writings that would have been considered embarrassing for himself or his message especially when it was presented to his immediate audience. Now, skeptics are correct when they point out this criterion is more frequently used in New Testament studies. But there's an obvious reason for this, which we'll come back to later. But first, we'll quote John P. Meyer, who helped popularize the use of the criterion and what it means. The criterion of embarrassment focuses on actions or sayings of Jesus that would have embarrassed or created difficulty for the early church. The point of the criterion is that the early church would hardly have gone out of its way to create material that only embarrassed its creator or weakened its position in arguments with opponents. Rather, embarrassing material coming from Jesus would naturally be either suppressed or softened in later stages of the gospel tradition. And often such progressive suppression or softening can be traced through the four gospels. Now, it is false to say only Christians use this criterion, because a good example of it in play comes from atheist and New Testament scholar Gerd Ludemann, who uses it to argue it is likely Peter actually did deny Christ three times, as no later Christian would make up such a shameful story about one of the founders of the church. So with this example, we can see the criterion of embarrassment in play. Something that was embarrassing for the church probably did happen because there's no reason to make up a story that puts Peter in such a negative light. And it makes more sense that they were trying to be accurate about what actually took place the night Jesus was arrested. Now, when you read scholars from Daryl Bach to John P. Meyer, they tend to use this criterion, but still acknowledge its limitations. Like all the criteria we examine, however, the criterion of embarrassment has its limitations. It must always be used in concert with other criteria. Some Christians do overemphasize the criterion of embarrassment's power, but also some skeptics tend to overemphasize how much weight other Christians are actually placing on this. So let's set the record straight and point out this criterion has limitations and should be used with caution. Not everything we believe would have been embarrassing necessarily was, and if something was embarrassing, that doesn't necessarily prove the account is true. However, just as Ludemann employed it, it does provide support that something likely did happen if the authors had no reason to make it up due to the negative light it could put them or their movement in. Now, it is false to say that these basic principles are never used outside of the Bible because, quite frankly, they just arise from basic investigation skills. And we can see how other historians readily utilize the same basic principles. In Akhenaten in the Origins of Monotheism, James Hofmeyer briefly talks about the first intermediate period of Egypt in a piece of wisdom literature that speaks of this time period called the Teaching of Merikari. In it, Merikari is offering advice he received from his father, Mary Ibre, who at one point admits defeat and failure, which is totally uncharacteristic for pharaohs who constantly boasted of their accomplishments and even tried to spin defeats into sounding like victories. Hofmeier employs basic principles of embarrassment to argue the admission of defeat means it likely did happen. Mary Ibre, uncharacteristically for a pharaoh, takes the blame, even though he was not directly involved. Norati commanded his troops 
to desecrate the long revered necropolis that went back to the end of the 4th millennium BC. What makes Mary Ibre's confessions credible is that Egyptian kings rarely admit wrongdoing, and there is no political advantage for this monarch to make such an admission. The reality is that pharaohs typically do not report on failures, or they turn them propagandistically into successes. Consequently, one ought to consider the descriptions of fighting in Abydos as reflecting the struggle between North and South in the First Intermediate Period. In the Assyrian Annals, the kings constantly boast of their victories and the spoils they brought back from war. However, there is one strange admission from the king Sennacherib. Right in the middle of boasting about kings he subdued and lands he took, he mentions how Hezekiah the Jew defied him. However, instead of killing him or deporting him back to Assyria, Sennacherib says he made Hezekiah a prisoner in Jerusalem, his royal residence, like a bird in a cage. This seems odd, because throughout his annals, he boasts about subduing and deporting, and his god Asher bringing death to his enemies. Yet Hezekiah is left in Jerusalem after a pretty big offense. According to the biblical account, the rationale for this is that when the Assyrians surrounded Jerusalem, the angel of the Lord went out and killed thousands, causing the Assyrians to pull back. And the Assyrians reluctantly seemed to embarrassingly admit that they could not take Jerusalem even though they put their own spin on the event in how they reported it. Archibald Henry Sace noticed this and pointed out that this admission supports the conclusion that Jerusalem was never taken by Sennacherib. The narrative of Sennacherib itself contains an indication that the conclusion of the campaign was not so successful as the author of it would have us believe, and that the Assyrian king was forced to return home without having accomplished the main object of the invasion of Judah. Though Hezekiah was shut up in Jerusalem like a bird in a cage, in a line of forts built against him, he was nevertheless allowed to remain there unmolested. Sennacherib admits by his silence that he never penetrated within the walls of Jerusalem. So Sennacherib had to admit the embarrassing fact that he never took Jerusalem and had to try to spin what really happened into sounding like a victory, instead of making up a myth that he did pillage Jerusalem. Sace relied on principles used in the criterion of embarrassment to help support the accuracy of the account that Jerusalem was never captured. In writing about Confucius, H.G. Creel employs the criterion of embarrassment in a very similar way to what we see in New Testament studies. In speaking about the reliability of one of Confucius' books, he says, One of the best evidences of its authenticity is the fact that while the Analects is obviously a Confucian book, it contains much that Confucians would have preferred that it did not include. Chapter 19 details squabbles between the disciples, and 1925 tells us that one of them said that Confucius was no better than the disciple Zhu Kung. In 626, it is related that Confucius had an interview with a notorious duchess. This has embarrassed countless prudish Confucians and was used by their enemies to mock them in Han times. Yet these things were not deleted from the text, which must increase our respect for it. This example is extremely similar to how New Testament scholars use the criterion of embarrassment within the Gospels. It is unlikely the early church would have made up facts that would have allowed their enemies to mock them. Jan Vencina evaluated oral traditions in Africa and employed the principles of the criterion of embarrassment as part of his assessment on whether or not an oral tradition was accurate. To quote, Sometimes it's possible to provide proof that a given tradition is unlikely to have been falsified. A case in point is where a tradition contains features which are not in accord with the purpose for which it is used, such as the Bushongo tale about a battle in which they lost and at which one of their kings was killed, or another which tells us the death of a king called Mabung Ilang, who was ambushed by the enemy and killed by a poisoned arrow. In neither of these tales are the facts likely to have been falsified. They are part of the tribal tradition, but only transmitted in secret, precisely because they go against the purpose of the tradition which is the enhancement of national prestige 
The events recorded are intrinsically incompatible with the interests the traditions in question are supposed to defend. Similar examples abound. In Rwanda, for instance, the loss of the royal drum, symbol of the country's unity, is remembered and the death of several kings. In Burundi, it is admitted that a battle was lost and a king killed, etc. Here too, the events described are diametrically counter to the purposes the tales are meant to fulfill, and a certain amount of embarrassment is noticeable whenever events of this kind are recalled. One may take it that traditions such as these can be relied upon. Martin Goodman even applies principles of the criterion of embarrassment to the works of Josephus. He says, to accept Josephus's often tendentious evaluation of the motives and characters of the Jews and Romans, whose actions constitute his narrative, would be rash. But to accept the details of his narrative, particularly when they contradict his own explanations of events, and so survive in the narrative only because they happened, is reasonable. As a result, the story of Jerusalem in the years up to 70 CE can be told in far more depth than that of any other city in the Roman Empire at this time, apart from the story of Rome itself. In other words, Josephus often would report things that contradict his own explanations, and Goodman notes this is a good reason to trust him on details of an event when this occurs. Now despite these examples, it is true the criterion of embarrassment is more heavily used in New Testament studies. But this would be expected, since there is an excessive amount of unnecessary skepticism when it comes to even the simple matters of what the New Testament says. In researching for this video, I emailed a few scholars to ask if they knew any additional examples of the criterion of embarrassment being used outside of the New Testament. Within 15 minutes, Daryl Bach replied back to me with, Why would it be? Those works do not work in this kind of sociological context with this kind of skepticism. Which is exactly right. We don't have the same level of skepticism employed for other ancient works as we see thrown at the New Testament. Perhaps if there was a group today that was excessively skeptical of the life of Hannibal and tried to doubt anything Polybius said, our earliest surviving source, because he wasn't corroborated by another source from that same time period. If this was the case, we might see the criterion of embarrassment used more. If someone was arguing it is likely Polybius fabricated many of the events he writes about, we could easily counter that Polybius was on the Roman side and writes details about Hannibal that would contradict one of his main motives, which was to paint Rome in a noble and triumphant light. Hannibal not only bested the Romans on their own turf several times, he even escaped them by committing suicide, avoiding a public execution in Rome. These are unlikely things someone writing for Rome would fabricate, and would probably only have written them down if they actually happened. But we don't have to do this, because the principle of charity is intuitively applied to Polybius, and we don't have to defend his account, even though he is writing decades after the events of the war with Hannibal occurred, or that no other sources from his own time period corroborate his account. We don't play silly jingles when people cite him saying, oh, because Polybius tells me so. To strongly imply his writing should always be assumed as questionable until something corroborates his account. Instead, we assume his account is innocent until we have a reason to doubt it. The same cannot be said of the biblical texts, where some very liberal scholars call into question just about everything in the Gospels, including the very simple sayings of Jesus. So we employ things like the criteria of dissimilarity and embarrassment to show there are good reasons to trust specific things recorded in the Gospels. I could understand someone's doubting the miraculous without additional evidence to support those claims. But as Bach notes, the skepticism for the biblical text is excessive and not the same when it comes to other ancient documents. As some skeptics strongly imply the Bible has to be assumed as questionable, even on mundane things it reports. And so, this is why you see the criterion of embarrassment used more when it comes to biblical studies.